Okay, well, let me um, welcome everybody to our second uh, meeting on micro NTA and other topics of interest. Um, we're going to be continuing to explore the possibilities of micro NTA, but um, last week we had a number of talks that were specifically on micro NTA. This week our talks are um, on topics that have some relation, but really are um, just topics of, of interest on which there were uh, interesting papers to be presented and so on. Um, so, uh, but we, when participants expressed interest in this meeting last time, they were also invited to suggest topics uh, for discussion, for questions uh, to be discussed, uh, considered and discussed in the open meeting. And we have quite a number of those that we'll be talking about today in a somewhat structured way. The people who suggested them are generally going to be uh, introducing the question and um, perhaps um, running the discussion. Uh, and we'll see how that works. And our, our plan and hope is to have much more open discussion this week than we had last week. And that means uh, you all who are uh, here and listening, we hope you'll be talking to each other and to us. And there are two ways of doing this, as, as you know if you read the um, agenda. One is just uh, the way we were talking a moment ago. Uh, if you want to say something, you try to <laughs> find a way to get your word in. Uh, you unmute yourself or whatever. Or perhaps you try raising your hand in the uh, participants, um, you know, heading you have an option of, of raising a, a virtual hand. Um, so that's one track. And then the other track is through the chat. And there will be a chat monitor kind of keeping track of the flow of uh, chat entries. And then uh, that chat monitor will from time to time uh, speak up and either call on, on someone who chatted or summarize the chat question themselves, that sort of thing. Uh, so we, I don't think we did this in any uh, systematic way last week and it's sort of a new uh, experiment for us. I hope it goes well. We'll see as we go along and this is all very informal. Okay, well, uh, let me ask um, Gretchen just to remind us of all the, uh, the little technical matters, how we're going to do these things. And uh, so, Gretchen. Thanks, Ron. Um, just a couple of things. So the meeting is being recorded, both the um, video and audio and the, uh, what goes in the chat box. So, um, if you are uh, want to write anything in there, um, it will be part of the recording of the meeting. Uh, let's see what else. Um, if we could have everybody please go to the chat box and just write your name and email address as I am about to do over there. That way we're able to have a record of uh, everyone who has attended. Um, and then, yes, as Ron said, we'll use the chat box. We tried not to last time, but if you think your audio is wobbly or your internet is wonky or you want to put in a question but then you have to leave, feel free to put it in the chat box. We'll be looking at that uh, this time. Um, and or you can just on the participants panel, you can click the raise your hand box and that will also help us see um, that, you know, you're waiting to make a comment or a question and we'll try to uh, call on you specifically because in this format, it can be hard to sort of make your presence known instead of if, you know, 
depending on how the audio is working. Um, and then the final thing is, as many of us are used to now, when you're not speaking, please mute yourself because that improves the overall audio. And uh, if anybody has any technical problems, you can put that in the chat to me and I'll try to help you out. Um, if you're presenting, I'll ask you to share your screen and hopefully that'll go smoothly, but if not, we'll work it out as we go. All right, that's it. Thanks, back to you, Ron. Well, thank you, Gretchen. And our first uh, topic is how to deal with uncertainty in NTA estimates. We've occasionally talked about this, um, but uh, I don't think we've, at least I don't recall any session at past meetings where we've uh, brought it up explicitly. And um, CO, and I think maybe also Alexia, someone else uh, raised this as a, a, a topic that uh, we should discuss, and we're going to do it now. And so let me turn it over to CEO, who's going to be chairing this first. Okay, thank you. Whatever it is. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, no? Yeah. Well, this is, um, well, we all know that NTAs are very good to analyze intergenerational distribution, but of course, intergenerational distribution is linked to intra, so it's immediate or necessary or whatever to go on to that also. And also, actually, with NTAs, we can't really go deeper into the micro level because we have micro data. So it's, it's a topic which is interesting. Okay? And there are already some attempts to do NTAs by education, income quantiles. And yesterday, or last week, we saw some presentations on inequality measures. But I think that there is a previous requirement that it's that to check if our profiles are significant. I, I, I thought of that many times, but at, at some point I received a referee asking me that, so I thought, let's, let's really worry about it, because it's true, it's quite, quite true that we need to check that. Because we are comparing profiles from different countries and from different in, types of, of individuals, and we, we should check if they are significant. Okay? And I, I've, I've only seen a work that Ivan did some time ago, and he's going to present it now, I think. And I don't know why we didn't do it, probably because we are not experts or because it's a quite tiring task, because we, we should check every single profile. And in some cases, we couldn't do it because we have external, we have data from external sources that can, it's not at the micro level. So it's not a, a clear and straightforward task, but I think it's something we, we should take a look at it. Like, let's say as a prerequirement to go on the, to the micro level, okay? Uh, now we are actually doing some profiles by education and family type, and we are and we are finding the problems to this is like another problem which is related that we have smaller and smaller samples, and we get less and less significant values. So we should worry about which is the level we can reach with with, with the micro that we have. Okay, this is basically what I was going to say. Well, we, we, one of the problems that we, one of the things we did to face that was to use five years age group instead of single year. This is something you can do, but still the significance you, has to be checked. Okay, so that's that's all what I wanted to say. I don't know if Ivan is there. Is Ivan there? No. Uh, Ivan is not here. I just sent him a message to see if he could join us. Uh, just an email. So it's. Um, who knows what happened, uh, but um, if anybody else uh, has any comments on this and wants to jump in, please do. If uh, we may return to it, if Yvonne is able to join us later, who knows, maybe he thought it was the same time as last week or something. Yeah. He was planning so to speak. Maybe I can add something to see you. Uh, so I have the same experience like CEO. We are always asked whether the age profiles are significantly, I mean, and I think it's even more important, I mean, in this workshop when we talk about other socioeconomic uh, differentials, because I think to really understand how these differences across these other socioeconomic differentials are significant uh, compared to the age structure, I think it becomes even more necessary to do it, but I'm honest, I 
discussed this several times also with Bernhard, but I think it's not easy. I think which methodology we want to apply. I think there are different starting from simulations or other arguments how we can do this and maybe Miguel might add something to really, I think, out of really incomplete survey data to really get a significant estimate uh, across different groups. And I think it's the methodological issue, I think, which is so difficult here. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexia, could you say uh, what sort of simulation uh, you might run? It sounds like a good idea. Yes. <laughs> I'm unmuting myself a little bit now. Yeah, now I'm unmuted again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I was like thinking uh, simple, I think of some patient possibly uh, uh, inputs we could use here. I mean, what we are doing also with Miguel when we're trying to understand heterogeneity across different socioeconomic groups. And maybe Miguel, I see you there. You might add more about these methodologies we are also using now for the COVID. And I think it's really to understand this difference, I mean, across these different groups and I guess, uh, or Monte Carlo simulations. I mean, I think there are different kind of techniques we could apply. I mean, really depending on the data we have. Uh, so that's uh, a very general, to be honest, I mean, uh, <laughs> feedback, but I think uh, I would like to learn more from all of you, I think, uh, what would be the appropriate methodology. Should I add then something? It's, I mean, this is still a work in, in progress that we are doing, uh, and we have not applied yet to NTA, uh, but we are running huge uh, general equilibrium models where we are introducing heterogeneity using Bayesian methods. Uh, but we are just um, uh, fit, uh, we are using just macroeconomic data, so not the NTA profile. So this is the next step once that we finish. We are hoping to have a version, so a draft, maybe by the end of the month or probably by the second week of uh, June. But until then, I mean, it's probably better not to risk <laughs> saying too much just in case that we see that it doesn't work properly. But this is one possibility, start using Bayesian methods in order to, uh, to complete the, the lack of information. Yeah. David? I've got one suggestion um and that is you know the the, the issue with with the nta is that you've got these cascading profiles so what, what you've got is you've got you know the, the there's the, the sort of main profiles that you estimate and then there are various other profiles that depend on those estimates and then other prof and other estimates and then profiles that maybe depend on those second order estimates and so one way of, of dealing with this in a, in a non-parametric way maybe to use bootstrapping um, where what you do is you re-estimate the, the profiles of a subsample um, and then you can get an idea of how much sample variation is driving uh, your results. So what, what that would basically mean is that you, you choose a subsample of the data, recalculate the NTA profiles and then uh, repeat, repeat that calculation many, many, many times and then you get a distribution of what the profiles look like based on on sampling variation um, and so then you know it's a it's time consuming because you have to re-estimate the NTA again and again and again um, but you know under under probably quite mild assumptions um, the distributions that you get would be asymptotically correct so that would be another way of doing it okay. Does that, so uh, does that include any sort of um, uncertainty around the macro controls or do we just sort of take macro controls as like, those are correct and they, we don't worry about their uncertainty. I mean, and also, so my second question, do any of national accounting experts out there, do you know if anybody puts uncertainty around their GDP estimates? I've never seen anything like that. But I mean, uh, maybe uh, I'm, they have to wrestle with the same kind of issue as well. 
I mean, to, to, to answer your first question, the, the, the simplest way of doing it is, is to do what we've done, you know, in NTA, and that is to treat the, the national accounts estimates as, you know, written on tablets of stone, you know, coming down from heaven. Um, and of course, in the UK, we see some alarming changes in historical values of, of, um, of GDP aggregates. So, you know, when they changed, I believe James will know this more than me, but when they changed the calculation of imputed rents, um, you know, it may have led to, a, is it a 20% change in GDP 20 years ago? It was a very large change in GDP. Went up by 70 billion, imputed rents went up by 70 billion of, and GDP is roughly 1.5 trillion. So whatever that percentage is. So, you know, so, so, so the, the whole problem is, you know, looking at GDP estimates is often like looking at Russian history is you never know what's going to happen there. Okay. Um, but, but, you know, the, the, the simplest way of doing the bootstrap would be just to treat the macro, the macro controls as fixed and then just, it, just get an idea of simply of sampling variation from your, from your sample. So, and I, you know, I don't know that, you know, the, the standard bootstrap is just to leave one point out at a time. Um, you know, that, that would probably be extremely inefficient in our case. So maybe you could leave a certain fraction of the sample out at each time and then re-estimate or, or you resample from the sample with replacement. Um, there are various techniques, but that's the basic idea. Um, and in terms of, of um, macro controls, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, James would probably know better than me about the about macro controls, but I've never seen uh, GDP estimated with any uncertainty at all. Well, with GDP, you have the three estimates. So you have the statistical error, and then you have the input-output matrices, which are often used to estimate degrees of confidence in your aggregate estimates. So there is a bit of work on it. Um, in that they try and use the input output matrices to balance the totals and the way that they allocate the error is they have to make some estimate of the uncertainty of the respective totals and they use that to aggregate the statistical error across the GDP estimates. So there is work in the macro literature. I'm, I'm, I'm not desperately familiar with it but um, it kind of works that way. Hey, Miguel has been waiting patiently with his raised hand, so <laughs> I'm going to ask him for his comment. Mm, thank you. Uh, so with boot, bootstrapping, I was, I was initially thinking that bootstrapping was the best strategy. The only part that I'm scared uh, is that once that we start splitting the sample, whether the profiles that we're obtaining are representative of the universe. And if they are not, we will be repeating the mistake one and on and on and on. And <laughs> so it will be, com be completely biased. And regarding the GDP, I guess that most of the people working in time series analysis are calculating all the time the confidence intervals for, for the GDP. I mean, it's... Uh, I don't know personally many of them, but uh, but uh, I know well that the, they are continuously calculating uh, the the standard deviations of the GDP estimates. Um, <clears throat> it, it seems to me. Often with the NTAs and probably with GDP also, the big problems may not be sampling errors, um, sampling uncertainty, but rather, I don't know what you would call them, systematic structural uh, uncertainties. Um, so for example, if we come to comparing, asking whether differences in profiles by socioeconomic status are uh, significant. My biggest worry is the assumption that we 
make, maybe there's some way to avoid it, I don't know, that uh, when, we, when we calculate our adjustment factors to, make, to meet the control totals, we assume they're the same across all subgroups, and including by, uh, say, household play education of head, which would often be our SES. But it may be that um, rich people understate things dramatically, poor people may understate things or overstate them for other reasons. And th there just may be big differences in the way people respond to those surveys. Uh, and when we assume that we use the same adjustment factor for every profile, uh, we may be introducing errors and we're not going to pick them up by looking for sampling errors. And in terms of using the standard NTAs, um, well, I'm not so familiar with all the countries and regions, but I know when I've tried working on the Latin American data, there's just always this big question in the back of, I think, everybody's mind about labor income, which is there, I hope there's someone from Latin America here, but my recollection is that there are many countries, some countries don't even report labor uh, income in their national accounts. And sometimes um, NTA has had to get a central bank to make a special estimate for it and so on. And there have been lots of questions raised about uh, that component. And I know savings rates uh, are another uh, suspect area in Latin America. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of money that leaves the countries in clandestine ways and gets invested abroad and that sort of thing. So I can see these kinds of problems also. Well, I guess that's, that requires a totally different approach and yeah, okay, I'll leave it at that. Hi, I was just gonna mention it would be great if we could start uh, routinely reporting um, these adjustment uh, factors that we use uh, in each of the country's uh, NTA estimates. Um, I think that would be really helpful in understanding to what extent uh, we're getting biased uh, estimates from the surveys themselves. And partly we may be um, able to uh, correct for some of these problems depending on how fine a disaggregation we're doing when we adjust to control totals. I can't remember now how fine we go when we're looking at asset income, for example. We break it down and try to adjust um, by subcategories of assets. I guess we must, we have something on housing, but I don't know how fine a disaggregation we currently do. Michael, you have your, your the hand raised thing. Do you wanna chime in? can just unmute yourself and yeah. No, sorry, I, I just, sorry. Uh, I think the way to calculate this uncertainty in the survey, it's really the way David suggested that we do bootstrap. I mean, we, we would have to take a sample from our sample population then calculate the age profiles, move it and adjust it to the macro control and do this like many, many times. And then we see how, in which area our estimates would, would lie. I, also I think for the, for the survey uncertainty, uh, this would be the way to go and to calculate it. Yeah, I mean, the advantage of doing it that way is that you don't need to worry about the derived profiles. Because, you know, I, I wrote code a long time ago that estimated um, standard deviations off of, of the, the profiles that are estimated first, you know, the ones that are estimated directly off the samples. Um, but then I realized that those aren't going to be any good for, for the, the, the next level of profiles. Uh, and, you know, by the time you get to the savings profile, then, you know, that's the, basically the accumulated error of all the other profiles plus true saving. And so, um, you know, you'd have to think very carefully about how to, how to do it analytically. Whereas with bootstrapping, it'll all just happen automatically. 
So, but as Ron says, it's only going to help you with sampling error. It's not going to help you with any, any of the other problems that we, the potential problems that we may have. Although, you know, it's a, I suppose it's a philosophical question about whether you call those uncertainty or not. Um, you know, I mean, they're methodolog methodological problems and they're the consequences of various assumptions that you make in the absence of any true information about the, the correct assumption to make. So, yeah, I don't know. But, but yeah, it's only going to help you with something there. Uh, I would suggest that we start solving problems one after the other, because I think uh, for some of them, we might not find solutions at all, but at least like this sampling uncertainty would be something which, which could be done, not, not too difficult. I should say some of the problems, if they're problems with macro controls, they may be problems for using NTA in some ways, uh, but for looking at SES differences, maybe they won't be a problem because the problem will be the same for every SES group. If you're using the same adjustment factors. And so it doesn't add uncertainty in those differences. So it may be a, that just the approach has to be, as is usually the case, has to be tailored to the question you're trying to answer. Thanks. Well, CEO, thank you very much and everyone. And I think we're ready to move to uh, our first presentation, which is, well, uh, uh, James and David, I'm not sure who is presenting it on uh, an update on the GWAS. And um, so we'll, they'll be presenting for perhaps 15 minutes or something. And then, um, let's see, that's going to be followed by Andy talking about um, issues of capital and wealth in NTA and um, and again, we'll have a general discussion then. Okay, so. So David, you So I, I, there I'll we go. Most, most of the talking, but hopefully not all the talking. Um, so James will jump in where I say something particularly um, controversial. Um, David, do you was, want to launch your slides or do you yeah. want me to, okay. I'll launch them. I, okay, I, made one small, I made one small change to them. So okay. um, let me just, sorry, let me just uh, share my screen, right? And yes. Then I think that's the. Hopefully I have enabled your actually ability to share screen. If not, let's see. Like there we go. Okay, good. <laughs> yes. Okay. So let me just zoom it up. So, so I'll only talk very briefly about this. I mean, um, you know, most of us have seen uh, GWAs, um, but really, this is the, the the motivation of the of the of the the question. And and this is a graph um, that shows the the total net worth of the public and the private sector in the UK. And David, uh, one second, if you want to put the uh, full screen, because right now we see your sort of screens on the side, and then the one main screen. So ah, if you okay, want to put it into presentation mode, no problem. Uh, sure. Thank you. How do I do that? Uh, uh, just like uh, you, just like it's a projector. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, um, so the, uh, so this graph shows the total net worth of the UK uh, and divided into the public and the private sector. And you see, you know, it's, the, the time period spans 1987 to 2017. Um, the, the, this paper really only spans the period from around 2005 to 2015. So it's sort of the right hand half of the graph. But what you see is you see that the, there's been a, over that period, there was a tremendous decline in the, um, the public sector net worth. And so that decline, and, and we've sort of played around with scales here. So for those people who get sensitive about m manipulating scales, we're, we're guilty. I get sensitive about it, but, um, but anyway, on the right-hand side, you see the public sector net worth as a percentage of GDP fell from 
um, just under 50% in 2005 to below zero. So there's been a tremendous decline. But at the same time, private sector wealth increased. Um, and you can see that's on the left-hand scale. And so, you know, the increase looks smaller, but it's about of the same magnitude or slightly larger. So it increased from about, you know, 450% of GDP up to just over 500% of GDP. Now, you know, if you look at this and you think, okay, in, in generational terms, you might say, right, well, you know, the, the increase in private sector wealth, um, the increase in private sector wealth um uh benefits the, the the old because because they own most of of the private sector wealth um and the decrease in in public sector net worth uh disadvantages the young because they're the ones who are going to have to pay off the government debt and so just looking at that picture um you may think that the financial crisis um therefore disadvantaged the young um, but what we show is that is that once you allow for capital transfers, and we do this using the gener gen uh, generational wealth accounts, um, then in fact uh, the increase in, in capital transfers over this period largely protected the young from the consequences of the decline in the public sector debt. And so, you know, this this aspect of this paper um, shows to us anyway um, the importance of capital transfers. So. Um, just a quick revision about what Gen GWA are. So what they basically are is they capitalize the NTA profiles. Um, so we really, uh, using demographic projections of the population and assuming that the profiles are, are fixed other than for due to changes in productivity, um, that allows us to create estimates of transfer and human capital wealth. And so by capitalizing them, we can then put them on the same page as measures of financial wealth, um, and estimates of future lifetime consumption. And that allows us to produce comprehensive lifetime balance sheets for each generation. Um, then what we can do is we can use um, intertemporal and intergenerational budget constraints to allow the construction of implied capital surpluses and deficits for each generation. And what we find unsurprisingly is that older generations in every country we've looked at and every time period we've looked at, older, period, older generations have capital surpluses um, these, because of the conservation of, of, um, of wealth that doesn't get destroyed when people die, uh, at least not financial wealth doesn't, um, they, they must be passed down and they're used to, to partly finance the capital deficits of the young. So, so in each country you've looked at, there's, a, there's sort of a, a dividing age, roughly the mid 40s. Above that age, people are in capital surplus. Below that age, people are in capital deficit. That means that to be in capital deficit means that the present value of your consumption exceeds the present value of the resources available to you, including your human capital, your accumulated financial wealth, um, and your transfer wealth. Um, and then what we can do is we can aggregate these capital surpluses and deficits across the whole population. And these can be regarded as measures of consumption sustainability and under mild assumptions, intergenerational equity using the same approach as um, Arbach, uh, Gokale, and Kotlikoff, uh, when they looked at intergenerational equity using uh, GA. Um, we call these aggregates for the private sector a savings gap. Uh, the, the public sector, just like um, uh, generational accounting, we call it a fiscal gap. And we add these two together and we get an overall measure of the sustainability of the economy, of consumption in the economy, uh, and that we call the consumption gap. In this paper, we calculate these GWAs annually for the UK from 2005 to 2015, and we use them to examine changes in the intergenerational economy over the period. That's all I'm gonna talk about the methodology. If you're really interested, there's 80 pages of very densely and dense text waiting for you um, at that link. So, you know, what, is it, what does it really say about sustainability and equity? Well, you know, another point that you may take from the graph that, that I showed on slide one is, you know, there seems to be some offsetting nature between private wealth and public wealth. And that's certainly what the, the overall um, picture that emerges from the GWA seems to confirm, because what we find is that the, the, the fiscal gap, which is the line at the top, um, increases dramatically as a consequence of the public sector response to the, the financial crisis starting in 2008. Um, but at the same time, or, contemporaneously there's been an increase 
um, in the in the value of of uh, of financial wealth, um, and that decreases the savings gap. Now these are are, are relative to um, different measures. So the one is expressed as a measure of public as a percentage of public consumption. The other one is a percentage of private consumption. So don't be too alarmed when you see that the consumption gap worsens slightly, um, but is actually very, very stable um, over the period. And in fact, ends the period almost exactly um, where it began. Um, so, so that's the sort of very overall picture. Um, when you, you sort of drill down and see what exactly is driving these changes, um, it gets kind of complicated. And here, uh, what we've, we've used these GWAs to do is to prepare um, uh, individual um, generational accounts, uh, generational wealth accounts. So these are on an individual rather than on an aggregate level. And what you see is there's, there's rather a, a big division between people you might call older um, and people you might call younger. And that's that sort of purple line that, that I've drawn across the, the, the tables. So I'll just very quickly go through each of the, the, the main elements of this. In the, as far as the, the, the public sector is concerned, it's, it's, it's pretty stable. Um, but what you see is that the, the elderly, as a result of the financial crisis, so what we've done is we've taken the per capita generational wealth accounts for 2015 and subtracted the 2005 per capita accounts after adjusting for um, productivity and price changes. So this shows the sort of real change in these, in these variables after taking into account the fact that uh, the younger generations are more productive than the older generations. And so what you see is that the, um, the older generations pay more tax than they, they were expected to pay in 2005, um, but they also uh, receive lower transfers, whereas the opposite is true of the young. So the young receive higher transfers in expectation, um, but they pay um, slightly uh, lower tax. Um, in terms of the life cycle wealth, um, so that's the public side of the, the accounts. Now we turn to the private side. Um, in terms of the, the private generational account, uh, what happens is that the, the, the private and public consumption of the elderly uh, increased. It's a negative number here, but that's because uh, of the way that life cycle wealth is calculated. So those negative numbers mean that the, the present value of their consumption increased, but especially of private consumption. Um, and the labor income of the elderly increased. But what we see is we see opposite, or the, the older rather, um, I wouldn't describe myself as elderly, but unfortunately I'm in that bracket over there. Um, so, but certainly what, what seems to have happened is that the, the younger people have, have seen falls in their private consumption, falls in their public consumption, um, and for the very young, falls in their labor income. Uh, then, uh, in terms of private transfers, there's, there's not much going on. So, so one of the, the surprises of this is that, you know, if, if you believe the NTA methodology of calculating these private transfers, older, older people do not respond or have not responded or did not respond to the financial crisis by spending more on their children. Um, so there wasn't much change there in terms of private transfers. Um, but in terms of, of, of assets, there's been a very large change where the, the assets of the elderly have risen dramatically. Um, and that's because they own most of the assets in the economy. The young, younger don't own much. Um, so there wasn't a terribly much of an increase, a slight decrease uh, here for the very young caused by higher borrowing. Um, and then overall, uh, what you see, in, in the, and this is where the capital transfers come in. Um, what's happened is that the capital surpluses have increased dramatically for everybody across the board. And so what that means is that there's a much greater ability of the elderly to pass down um, capital down to support the younger generations. And the younger generations have actually altered their consumption in such a way that they need less in order to sustain their um, consumption. Um, so, so what this really shows is that, the, is that there's this as a response to the financial crisis, there was an increase in, in wealth, um, and that increase was not entirely consumed um, by, the, by the elderly. That, and we estimate that about 60% of the increase in the wealth was consumed by the elderly, and that meant that 40% of the, or will be consumed by the elderly, 
And that, that meant that about 40% of that increase is going to be bequeathed down in the form of capital transfers um, to the young. This is just a, a different way of showing the same picture. And what we, we calculate here is we calculate um, the, the total value of transfers to a particular generation from, their, from those generations older than them. And we divide it into, whoops, we divide it into uh, capital transfers, public transfers, and private transfers and show it for various years. And I've shown that sort of division between the older and the younger here. Um, the first thing to note from these graphs is that the, the value of, of private transfers remains very, very stable over the period. Um, and so what, what we don't see is any, any impact of either the older people spending more on their kids as a result of the financial crisis or changes in household structure as a result of the financial crisis. You know, people, kids, older kids moving back to stay with their parents, to the extent that it happened, um, it didn't really affect our private transfers terribly much. You can see that shape is remarkably consistent across the different periods. Um, but what you do see is you see a big change in the, in the public transfers. And so what you see is that there's been a dramatic um, increase in the, in, the, in the public sector debt that's being passed to the young. And so, you know, uh, it started off over here at about minus 0.50% of GDP. By 2008, it was minus 100% of GDP. By 2010, it was 150% of GDP. And by 2015, as a result of austerity and projected austerity, um, it had fallen back down to about 75% of GDP. And that shows that the decline in public wealth being borne by, largely by the young. But the surprise for us was the capital transfers. And you see here that the capital transfers started off negative. Sorry, I don't know why it keeps jumping like that. Um, it started off negative. In other words, there was a, a net shortfall in capital. So if you took the total amount of the surplus capital of the elderly, capital that they weren't going to use to sustain their own consumption, um, it wasn't enough to finance the deficits of the young. And that got, got worse in 2008, um, it got improved slightly by 2010, but by 2015, the increase in the value of this capital that wasn't going to be consumed by the elderly, so that, that the elderly were basically leaving on the table for the young, had brought the, the, the private sector effectively into balance. And so what that means is that in aggregate, at least, um, there was sufficient, there's sufficient capital in the economy to sustain the um, consumption of all living generations. So really, I mean, you know, we could talk about this paper for a long time. There's a lot more in it that I haven't shown you. But we argue that the, 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 the important point that it shows is that for a, if you want an accurate picture of intergenerational transfers, we think it requires two things. First, it requires that you integrate both the public and the private sectors. And you know, up to this point, economists, we think anyway, have tended to focus on individual elements of the intergenerational transfers, but they've not examined the entire picture. And this is despite a debate on Ricardian equivalence that goes back about 200 years. And sort of a related point, but not entirely um, the same point, is that it's necessary to include both capital and current transfers. And we think that in the UK, um, the capital transfers in the form of bequests are between six and 10% of GDP. And there are some authors out there who say that the um, inter vivos capital transfers uh, from the old to the young are roughly of the same magnitude. And when you add those together and allow for sampling error, you get something of the order of about 15% of GDP per year. And so those, even in the context of NTA, um, those capital transfers are very large. Um, and while, and the, the second conclusion from this work might be that, you know, while current transfers are dominant in the public sector, um, in the private sector, capital transfers are actually extremely important determinants of intergenerational well-being, and they lead to sort of surprising outcomes, such as the idea that, that these changes that we saw um, as a result of the financial crisis in both the private and the public sector did not unambiguously worsen um, the how how well the young fared relative to the old. So um, I'll stop there. I've used up my 15 minutes. Um, so that's where I'll stop the sharing. Thank you very much, uh, David. Very interesting. And um, now I'm going to turn it over to Andy.
Andy? Okay, and let's see if Andy is unmuted. I am, let's see. I'm trying to unmute you, Andy, but you will not be unmuted. <laughs> there. Okay. Um, we can go now. So, uh, yeah, my research on this topic involved going through old presentations that uh, <laughs> I've made. Uh, this one was with Ron, uh, although I think this mostly has my stuff. And the idea here is, uh, what would wealth accounts look like, in my view? Uh, I don't have any data. I don't know how to estimate these wealth accounts, although I agree with David and others that uh, they're very important, and we should figure out some way to do it. Uh, so uh, let's see here. How can I? get this to go forward. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so in a wealth account, says uh, Michael, I mean, David just showed, uh, we have uh, public and private wealth by age. And I think that uh, what a wealth account would look like is we would have an opening balance of wealth at the beginning of the period for each age. And that changes for each age group or cohort during that period. And a closing balance uh, or wealth at the end of the period. Uh, and so a very simple made up uh, private asset account. So this is just looking at the private side would look something like this. So we would have an opening balance uh, at each age. Uh, we have net changes in assets and then we have an ending balance and we would follow cohorts. So we would have assets by age, opening 15, net change 37, ending up with 52 in age two. Of course it would be well, anyway, forget the numbers are irrelevant here. They're completely unrealistic. <clears throat> now, let's elaborate on this a bit. Uh, what we have done in NTA is treat, uh, just look at saving, basically. We have assets at the beginning of the period, and then we have saving, and then we would have assets at the end of the period. And that, uh, doesn't look at anything that happens in a capital account. So what does a capital account include? Well, in addition to saving, uh, we would have these uh, four or these three ways in which assets change uh, for an age group or for the economy as a whole. One of those things is uh, called other changes in volume. So uh, that, this is something beyond what David's talking about here. Uh, so what might happen is there could be a natural disaster or there could be uh, a war uh, or, or something like that. And that would cause a change in assets. Well, that's not captured by anything that we do. Another thing is uh, revaluations. So that can happen, we can have a change in asset prices, uh, and that's not incorporated in the accounts. We can have a, uh, ex exchange rates could change. Uh, when it comes to transfer wealth, we can have changes in uh, present values. Uh, I guess that could happen in a capital account as well. So the interest rate may change, and that would lead to uh, <clears throat> revaluations of bond values and so forth. And then we have capital transfers. And I, uh, this is one that uh, we've had the most attention on in uh, NTA. Not that it's been fully incorporated, though maybe by some. But So uh, Miguel and Yvonne and David and Ron have all 
have been interested in the quest, as have uh, Nicole and I. Uh, and uh, so part of this is the quest, uh, but one of the things that uh, I've often felt, and I, I'm sure I've expressed this often, is what David has just said, which is that other capital transfers are very important in my in my view. Uh, when you look at the data that we have, asset income at young ages, it, I just see how it can be explained by the quest. I think there have to be very substantial uh, capital transfers beyond the quest that we are not really uh, measuring or estimating. So what, are that, what sorts of things might that include? Well, one thing is that we have households reclassified. So we have people who are the heads and then a year later, they're not the heads anymore. They have been overthrown by the younger generation who has taken over the household and all of its assets. And that leads to a capital transfer in, in NTA to the extent that wealth are signed to the household head. Um, but there could be other things that we don't really capture in, in NTA. So, for example, maybe your kids live at home with you and then uh, <clears throat> they're actually accumulating money so they can go out and get an apartment and then they leave your household with, with assets. Well, those are, those are capital transfers. That wasn't saving uh, that occurred during that period. And uh, <clears throat> so those could be substantial, and those aren't really captured in uh, NTA the way we are currently doing. So this is for assets. Now we could also, uh, let's see, apply these same concepts to transfer wealth. And, and you know, I, I must say Ron and, and David and James have thought a ton more about this than I have, so I can't, I don't really want to say too much. Uh, one thing I do want to say is that um, we have saving and dissaving that goes on with respect to transfer wealth over a period. So this is without any financial crisis or anything like that. We know that a cohort goes through a life cycle where uh, <clears throat> their transfer wealth is becoming more negative early in life and then it's becoming more positive later in life and then it's becoming more negative uh, towards the end of life. And that's a form of saving, there's a form of saving of transfer wealth that goes on there. <clears throat> that is, you know, one could include that in the current, in, in the current account. Uh, but we don't do that. But we could. We could uh, think about exactly how uh, that would be done. And then we have um, revaluations that occur. Uh, that could be, for example, Ron pointed out to me uh, yesterday that one thing is we would have unanticipated changes in survival. Uh, <clears throat> so we think uh, those are going to go down <laughs> this year <laughs> and so that would lead to a, that's going to lead to a change in uh, <clears throat> transfer wealth to the elderly uh, so uh, that is something that we can include in this uh, uh, capital uh, wealth account <clears throat> and then uh, we can also we have changes in policies that are not expected. So uh, our current administration could dismantle Social Security and Medicare. Uh, that would lead to a rather large uh, capital transfer. Uh, uh, but anyway, hopefully that won't happen. Uh, so uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, that's kind of how I would like to see us broadly approach this and I don't I don't think of this as competing with what David presented earlier. I think it could be incorporated into it and I don't quite know how one would do that, but I 
<clears throat> but I think it would fit in and, and uh, that this uh, sort of meshes well with what we've done elsewhere in uh, NTA. So thanks. That's two terrific uh, and very thought provoking talks. And let's just see what reactions people have. I can't see anyone. Let me try gallery view here. Do we have anything going on in the chat, Gretchen? No, everyone is just absorbing all of the giant ideas and wondering how we can make all this stuff happen, I think. <laughs> I think when I try to explain to people what national transfer accounts is, they usually think it's all about inheritance and capital transfers and so on. That's the way they think of it. Um, and we don't do that, <laughs> or we barely do. I think that's really important, and uh, I hope we can move forward with it in some concrete way and maybe have a working but James, were you going to say something? Yeah, I mean, I know, I mean, Hi Hippolyte's on the line, so that's good. But I, I know some countries probably have much better data on this than others, so... The, the French, because they love bureaucracy and everything, they have records on every dime that's passed from anyone to anyone. So they've got fantastic records on, on transfers or gift transfers, ministers' records. I just wondered what other countries had that data, because in, in some countries it's very difficult to, to, to research this and some other countries lend themselves to it. And maybe we could sort of um, piggyback on some of that work in other countries or whatever use our use the span geographical span well and i mean uh, hrs has bequest information and i think all of the hrs similar uh surveys have it as well so it's just i mean i think it's just a matter of every team has to tackle this additional survey because we don't use those surveys for our main nta because they're not completely representative across uh the age range so um, I mean, it is a pretty big ask, but probably plenty of research teams are already using those data. And I mean, I also, Miguel had a whole estimation basically trying to look at the bequest or guess about uh, what bequests must, must look like based on what our current accounts look like. So maybe he would want to talk about that too, what sort of where that kind of ended up and, and what ideas he had maybe to take that further or to compare it with actual data. Just quickly, and then I'll, I'll shut up because I've got to go over it when you get it. But um, the trouble with survey data is that it's terribly badly measured. It's really badly measured. So in terms, they're always retrospective questions of whether did you receive an inheritance in the last two years, three years, four years? Have you received any gift over that period? And people have an amazing ability to forget gifts from their in-laws. Um, so that just does not get recorded, for example. Um, so the great thing about administrative records is that, you know, you don't, you, you sort of find a way through this amnesia, this uh, very selective amnesia that you get in survey data, which is why we measure it so badly. Um, it's just, and that's the problem with surveys and why I was trying to sort of think about administrative records rather than thinking, you know. Anyway, I'll, I'll shut up. Thing. Miguel, did you want to? I mean, Ipoli first. Ah. Oh, thank you. Um, no, uh, it, uh, it's not uh, um, really something uh, uh, intelligent that I want to say, but uh, I, I, indeed uh, there is an issue about uh, having the data okay and uh, there is some work you know especially for some team in order to gather those data but there is also the issue of having like a, a, a full equation uh, a, a true equation that could link basically uh, the evolution of wealth and uh, the traditional uh, uh, let's say nta flow equation 
And uh, I remember uh, with Miguel, with James, with uh, David, with Ron, with, with Andrew, we discussed about that. Uh, some, some years ago, we started trying to uh, really write uh, this equation. And, um, and, and, and uh, all the, the, the input, you know, basically, that you presented, Andrew, were there. Uh, you know, there is a lot of difficulties. But there is also the difficulty which is linked to international trade and uh, with immigration and so on and uh, and and it's a um, and it's a daunting task actually to have this um, this uh, this uh, this nice uh, formal and mathematical framework that could link basically the the, the basic NTA work and the um, the, 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 the 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 wealth account um, so, so, so <laughs> that's it. Huh? So, so <laughs> to my knowledge, this is not done yet, but uh, it could be a, a nice uh, work, you know, for um, those of us that want to, to participate and huh? to, uh, to really tackle and to, to set up this equation. I mean, it's mostly at, uh, what Hippolyte is saying. We, we have been trying to do this since a while. Uh, in my case, I'm using the general equilibrium models, but uh, this is just a, a theoretical framework. And once that you are going into the actual data, then you will have to complicate so much the, the theoretical framework, but uh, that is such a daunting task that uh, that is almost unfeasible. You will need just a huge ERC project just to tackle this. Uh, so it's uh, it's extremely difficult. So I mean, with with the general equilibrium models that we are currently doing, part of the inter vivos transfers um bequests, uh, a lot of it you you can really replicate, but there are many other transfers, uh, financial transfers that you that they are not in the model directly. So you are missing a lot of information and you are deviating from the reality in, in some respect or in another. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's just a project on itself. You know, just a just a, a, a point on 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 Miguel's point and on on um, Andy's presentation as it relates to the, the first presentation, and that is, um, you know, in all of those changes that Andy mentioned in terms of you know changes in survival risk, changes in transfer wealth because of um, you know changes in government programs. Um, changes in household wealth because of, um, you know, emigration or immigration between households. You know, all of those are sort of combined together, natural disasters, all of those are combined together in our, in our aggregate estimates. So our aggregate estimates incorporate all of those. What we haven't done is, is split them up according to the different changes. So what we haven't done is, is um, you know, said this portion is due to revaluation, this portion is due to, you know, changes in social programs. You know, this portion is due to um, changes in unanticipated changes in survival. This portion is due to immigration. This portion is due to changes in household structure. We haven't done any of that, um, and we've just left it all as, you know, at the, at the, at the aggregate level. Um, and you know, the second, ch the big challenge we've had, and we've sort of had discussions with Hippolyte about this um a few years ago and that is about um the, the gwa is just a model of savings there's no investment in the gwa um you know there's no there's no background capital is not used for anything uh, there's no endogenous relationship between the, the capital and productivity of labor or interest rates or or, or anything else um and you know putting a a a, 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 a some kind of equilibrium relationship to provide the investment side of 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 the GWA is is a big challenge, and I think um, you know 
one of the uses of, of GWA might be to, to present results of gen general equilibrium models. So where you have um, you know, a, a fully specified general equilibrium model, if you, by presenting it in the form of a, of a GWA, I think it could make it relatively easy to, to communicate what the main um, results of that model might be. Um, but certainly we've had big challenges in trying to even build a, building a very simple, simply articulated general equilibrium model that captures just the basic relationships was very, very, very difficult. And, and and to go in, in that direction, I feel that my visit, a first step to would be to have a, a solo model, you know, a solo model with uh, many generations uh, will still, you know, be useful in order to give this structure and uh, to help for the use of capital. But uh, but this is a first step and indeed uh, we should go uh, go back you know to to what we want uh, something like a few years ago <laughs> i'm convinced that it should be done <laughs> and i will be happy to participate with all of you sorry about <clears throat> going away there for a second um i just was trying to send ron some uh phone information because i think his wi-fi just went away his internet connection went away um so, I mean, I think what's important also in the context of taking all of these meetings online and um, and having a virtual meeting this summer is kind of thinking about the process. I mean, it seems like the answer is reviving our working groups that, you know, we, that were really successful a few years ago at starting up efforts like the socioeconomic status estimates that happened in Latin America and some other countries and counting women's work and these things. And uh, so is to sort of fire those up again, make some kind of process to have meetings more regularly, archive sort of what's going on in those groups somehow. I mean, it's a lot of, it's a lot of time in terms of organizing and sort of administrative stuff. But I mean, the good part of right now is that it's so cheap to meet. Hang on, Ron's waiting to get in the meeting. So hopefully I will admit it and he will be joining us again but i mean if anybody wants to talk about how we could create this process or rather sort of um reanimate you know the working group kind of process and and have kind of benchmarks or regular something or other you know, um that would be uh, i think that would go a long way towards helping us make progress because it really does require overcoming a lot of inertia because everyone's working on uh, different things and so it helps to have some kind of regular process in place uh, to move forward. Well I'm out a little bit of the last things are so someone else should <laughs> be chairing now. Gretchen why don't you take over as chair? Okay, did I hear James wanted to? Uh, try yeah, to... I just had a very, uh, very simple question, which is, uh, you know, kind of a, anyway, my question is, um, when, you're, when you're talking about these uh, gener uh, wealth accounts, you know, wealth, there is public wealth and private wealth, uh, wealth owned by households, wealth owned by the government. So in the work that you've done, how do you allocate, how do you give an age profile to, to, uh, the public wealth uh, well i mean in terms of assets so public assets we the simple answer is we don't um so what we do there is we is we follow the the uh, approach used by ga and we don't disaggregate the the public wealth by age we just look at the aggregate um so uh yeah so that's that's how we do that and you and you know this, the the truth of the matter is that it's very very hard to do um so i know we're going to be talking about um distributional national accounts but there they're sort of various methods of of distributing the the public sector net worth um all we do is we we just put it at the at the bottom and and don't make any attempts to to allocate it across generations yeah i was wondering about this years ago because 
you know, of course, in the in the flow accounts, you know, asset income gets allocated according to uh, tax rates or tax payments, which kind of suggests that uh, you know if the uh, if the asset income is being uh, allocated by the tax uh, tax profiles, then in a sense, you know, the assets should be allocated like that too. But anyway, thanks. We have we have survey data, detailed survey data on private assets, and by private assets, you know, we include um, pensions of various kinds. So you know, in the UK, if you work for the government. Uh, you, you get a pension fund, we call that a private asset. The, even if it's a DB fund, it's a promise by the government to pay you. Um, so that is included in our estimates. Um, you know, we, there's sort of two schools of thought on, on how to handle uh, public infrastructure, um, like roads and public buildings and stuff like that. Um, you know, we, we go down one particular route there, um, but you could reasonably go down the other. Um, but private wealth is much easier to allocate across individuals, um, and we have and we use survey data for that. Thanks. Um. Have we reached a, a point where we should move on to the next topic? Uh, or was there any discussion of what might be done next, whether there's room for a working group on this or something like that? Um, I did bring up sort of how to move forward on these issues, um, but there wasn't any consensus on it. I mean, uh, you know, I, it takes somebody to say, I'm going to be in charge of organizing this stuff. <laughs> and it takes somebody to say, you know, I'm going to be in charge of keeping track of it and sort of administering information sharing on the NTA wiki or some other way. Um, and yeah, and sort of having some goal at the end, sort of, are we going for a working paper? Are we going for, you know, a, a conference specifically on new research that is, uh, you know, from in this area or sort of what's the focusing event? And then, of course, there's money. <laughs> you know, is there, who would fund this for everybody? Because it's certainly a lot easier to find somebody to do all this stuff if you actually pay them for it. I mean, just, just thinking aloud in terms of that last thing, surely, you know, sort of chatting to James about, about well, various things, but one of the things we were chatting about was the impact of this epidemic and the, the public response to it um, on intergenerational well-being. Um, and I think a big part of it is capital transfers. Um, so, you know, I think if we were looking for a grant, that might be, you know, I mean, you know, they always say, you know, anyway, if we were looking for a grant, it might be a good hook to, to get people interested in the topic um, and allow us to do the underlying, the underlying work. Not to be too macabre, but I mean, there is the, uh, there's the public uh, side of assets, but there's also the fact that uh, there are a lot of older people dying and there's going to be a lot of change uh, not only in bequests, but also in reallocation of transfer wealth from older people to the younger generations who are not going to have as many older... Anyway, all of this would have to be viewed uh, together in the same way that you and James were discussing a moment ago. But if any... Uh, David, for example, I wonder if you'd have any interest in, in taking on uh, organizing and leading a little... Uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely have an interest in it. Um, yeah, absolutely. But I, I, yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, I think that would be great. You, you could set your own <laughs> targets uh, because Gretchen outlined some interesting goals. But one of them, I mean, a, a, a approximate one would surely be to 
include something, maybe we already have included something in planning for NTA 13, I would think. Yeah. I'd be interested in being involved in any of this myself, but not uh, leading it for sure. Right. Yeah, let me give it some thought and I'll chat to James and then get back to everybody off, offline, I think would be the easiest. But I think that's a, that's a good way to proceed. 